Okay, everybody. Good evening if you're in Asia, uh, and good afternoon if you're in the Netherlands or Europe, uh, and good morning if you're in the US. So we have a, a great speaker. Uh, I know that because uh, I've seen him live in, in Amsterdam. Uh, his name is Murat, and Murat, glad to have you with us. So we, I think we met two months ago, more or less, when we were at to speak both uh, yeah. after each other. So we, we were both in front of the group. And, uh, and I, I think his lecture was so, so good that I asked him to come and speak here. So really- No pressure here, right? <laughs> no, a tiny bit of pressure. Uh, let me do a quick kickoff and then I'll hand over to you, right? Um, so I have a couple of questions for the audience and a couple of ground rules for very simple things. So if you want a certificate, there's a link in the chat. Uh, I think quite some of you uh, will need that maybe for university or, or your resume. So the link is in the chat. If you have a question, then put it in the Q&A box. So there's a Q&A tab in Zoom. You can put your questions there. If I can answer them directly, I'll do so. And otherwise, of course, I'll, I'll post them to Murat at the time. And that is uh, easy for him. So it's not interrupting uh, the speech. Um, and, and I want to know a couple of things before we start about who you are. So I have three questions for you. So Murat also gets to know you. And the first question is a simple one. And that is, what describes you best? Are you a student, professional, or retired? So let me know your answer, just to get a sense of who's in the audience. I know we have one special guest because I just got a couple of WhatsApp notes. We have the first employee ever for Chemo as well, who's joining again after a few years. So that is, uh, that's quite unique. And okay, let me close this one. I, I think uh, the answer is pretty clear. We have 84% uh, students, a couple of professionals, and we have three people who are retired. So. Welcome everybody, good to, uh, to see the, the mix. I think many, many, many students. Um, of course, I also want to know about your AI knowledge upfront. So how would you rate yourself uh, on your knowledge of AI? One means I know close to nothing and 10 means I'm a PhD uh, full master. Uh, so let me know what your self-assessment uh, says at the moment. And you can be honest, right? It's anonymous, so we, we can't see the names. See a couple of PhD uh, scholars. Okay, give it a few more seconds. Um, interesting distribution that you're uh, attracting. And what typically it's, it's a <laughs> clear sort of uh, starts at one with 60%, and, but now we have a, a different group. I'll, I'll share the results. So we have, I think almost everybody is in the one to five range, but we have a couple of okay. six and seven. One person at nine, I'm guessing that's the PhD uh, um, candidate that we saw. And, and the last question I have for you before I hand over is, is where you're from? And I have a sense, but I think it's good to actually check that. So pick the country or region that is uh, closest to where you live, right? So we know uh, the geographical location. Okay, I see lots of people coming in. I think the majority is in India, then second best is other. Let me know maybe on the chat what that is and, uh, and EU. Okay, thanks, I'll share the results. And, uh, and with that, I think we're, we're good to go. So Murat, I hope, I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of, of who you're talking mm -hmm. to. And, and with that, um, over to you. You have full control, I'll, um, I'll drop to the background so the focus is fully on. If there's a question or need for help anywhere, I'm, uh, I'm here to, uh, to jump in. That's fine, but I am just getting the message that the host has disabled the screen sharing. So I'm yes. not sure what is wrong. No, that is because I need to make you the host. And ah, no, look okay. at that. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one host allowed in Zoom. Here you go. That, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so let me see. Oh, there it is. I can do this. Yeah, that's visible, but you're on mute now. Still on mute. So yeah, that's the, the weird thing. Uh, if I share it, then I it stops. Uh, so let me try to share. Yeah, again, and worst case, oh, just the slides to me and I'll, I'll share them and you can just tell me when to click forward. Uh, we, we can try that as well. Uh, let me try another. So I'm not sharing yeah. my screen. Does that's this work? Fine. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Um, 
um, what to expect from AI in the future. So I, th this presentation is going to take 25 to 30 minutes, uh, depending on how fast I, I, I talk. Um, so that should give us plenty of time for questions. What I'm going to do is that I am going to start with a brief history of uh, AI. It's, it's a bit of a, a history lesson uh, uh, when it comes to AI. The concept of AI is, as you might know, not very new. Many philosophers have dabbled with stories and myths about artificial beings even back in the ancient times. However, when we talk about modern AI, the birth of that is attributed to a period when you know, the digital computers have emerged around 40s, 50s. There's even a specific moment in history where prominent people like Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy got together, and that's in 1956 in Dartmouth, to basically introduce the field that we know today as AI. Um, this is the golden age of what we call symbolic AI with semantic nas uh, natural language system. There's a little bit of connectionism with uh, the first neural networks by Rosenblatt, the perceptrons. Uh. Um, as you can imagine, with any new technology, there was a lot of hype, a lot of buzz and a lot of money involved. Um, this was the time of the Cold War. Um, you know, we thought that was ended. It hasn't yet, but still, this was the, the high times of the Cold War and certain capabilities around that time. Uh, such as being able to, to translate uh, Russian were quite strategic and, you know, people wanted to, uh, the governments mainly uh, wanted to invest a lot in there. And if you look at the chart, you will see that it didn't work out that well. Um, one of the main focus areas, the, the, the machine translation, failed horribly. There was this uh, example phrase that beca became very popular. Uh, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And uh, when this was translated with machine translation back in those times to Russian and back to English, it will become vodka is good, but the meat is rotten, completely missing the meaning and the intent of the original phrase. So it looked like the smart people uh, basically had underestimated the difficulty of this project. And this led to what we call the, the first AI winter, around 70s, let's say. And main reasons behind that was um, you know, lack of data, insufficiently complex algorithms. We only had simple perceptrons uh, by the time and limited compute power. And remember those things, these are gonna come back here later. Not long after, around 80s, as you can see from the chart, um, there was renewed interest. By the way, this chart is just you know, made up numbers. I, I, I wanted to have some uh, you know, dips and highs uh, uh, just to, to explain the, the story. Um, this another AI boom was due to a new uh, field, a new technology, which we called expert systems. And these were programs that could solve problems about a specific domain of knowledge using logical rules. If you ever use Prolog, you'll probably understand what I mean by that. Um, it's probably also the reason why you know, I studied AI in the 90s. And uh, this was the first language I, I learned because you know, these were quite popular in that time. But these were very fragile systems. They were unable to, to learn or adapt. And that also led to downfall of uh, these systems. Well, and then we had the second AI winter. And as you can see from the chart, things did get better around the late 90s uh, as I started to study AI. And that's a prime example of, I make this joke uh, very often, correlation is not causation uh, as things uh, accelerated from that moment on. We did start to get cheaper and faster computers. And we had also some breakthroughs when it comes to algorithms. Uh, we had uh, in the 80s already came up with uh, the back propagation, SGDs were uh, popular to train them. And with the dawn of the internet area, we also got access to ever growing amounts of data. So to me, there were three major developments that have caused an acceleration, this, uh, uh, you know, the, the exponential growth uh, in the advancement of AI. And I've already talked about this, right? I already you know, mentioned this during the, the, the uh, introduction of these AI winters. The holy trinity consists of three things, data, computer, and algorithms. Firstly, data. We have that in abundance nowadays, right? We are producing exabytes of data on a daily basis. Uh, I remember in the, back in my time, I'm old enough to say that, um, a, uh, you know, there were organizations who, uh, that were building huge clusters that were able to hold a terabyte of data. Today, I have thumb drives that can hold more data. Another thing is that all this data is available. It's stored somewhere on the internet and you can download it. Uh, you can get the full Wikipedia, full GitHub content. So there is a lot of information that's being produced and is being made available for people. Next to data, we have compute. Um, we have you know, much more compute power at our, our disposal. Nowadays, our you know, phones are much more powerful than the supercomputers of uh, my time even. And that makes it possible to build bigger and better models and do that often enough. So you can try out different things. 
uh, again, I, uh, uh, I, I remember in my time when I had to uh, train neural networks uh, with only a couple of hidden layers of uh, hidden uh, units of, I don't know, hundreds, uh, uh, it will take hours, maybe days. And today, you know, this will be seconds, maybe minutes at most. There is a lot of invest investment in special hardware. GPUs are getting better, faster. Um, but there's also a lot of special hardware being uh, designed and made available. Lots of ASICs, uh, and as you know, part of Google, I have the luxury of being able to work with TPUs, and these are special hardware that makes you know that makes very uh, make it possible to run uh, at, in the essence matrix multiplications, which is the the, the underlying technology or algorithm of, of neural networks, in a very timely fashion. So if you have uh, um, huge neural networks that take weeks or months to train, you will be using TPUs to to accelerate that. And finally, we also made some significant improvements to the algorithms we use. And there's a lot of things, and I won't be able to talk uh, all of them. I'm going to mention just three of them and you know, briefly introduce them just to set the context. So deep learning. Deep learning is, in essence, not very different from multi-layer perceptrons or recurrent networks that we had back in my time even, but then on steroids. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's not something uh, um, basic. It's, uh, the, the, it, there, there's been lots of improvements with respect to architecture of these things. We have nowadays uh, convolutional neural networks. We got uh, uh, long short-term memory units, the LSTMs, uh, the, the GANs, and uh, we have also made lots of improvements when it comes to you know, how you optimize these things. Uh, you've got uh, the, the uh, rectified linear units for activation functions, and that, you know, there's lots of different versions of that as well. You've got things like dropouts, pooling, adaptive optimizers. So there's a lot of improvements, although they sound very small, but at the end, when they're accumulated, they have made a huge difference to what we can do today with these neural networks. Um, reinforcement learning is another one. And uh, again, reinforced learning is not a very new thing. Uh, it's been around for a while, but we did make some improvements in that area too. And just for people who have never heard of this, um, when we talk about machine learning, we tend to focus on supervised or unsupervised algorithms. And supervised meaning that if you have uh, an input data set, you have the corresponding label with it, right? What it means to have these inputs and the corresponding output. And unsupervised doesn't really have that, but kind of does a different way of, you know, clustering and that kind of stuff, uh, uh, getting, you know, making sure that the things that are similar belong together. But there's also a category of problems when there is no immediate correlation between an action and its outcome. And reinforcement learning plays a role in there. And it's, uh, it typically works with what we call intelligent agents. And these intelligent agents uh, can learn without being presented labeled input and output pairs, like they will be in a supervised uh, setting. Um, the, the whole concept focuses on finding the balance between exploration and exploitation by taking actions and getting rewarded on the long-term effect of those. If you look at this example, this game, uh, moving the, the, the bar at the bottom is a, a pixel to the right doesn't immediately necessitate that this is gonna you know, give you the best reward. So there has been some improvements in this area to correlate these actions to long-term gains. Uh, um. This approach has helped us, you know, not only have, have computers play uh, uh, games and beat them, but also for robotics, autonomous driving, uh, data center cooling, and even more. One more interesting area is transformers. And before we dive into the, the concept of transformers, which have, I think, revolutionized the whole uh, way of how we build neural networks today, is um, let's talk about a little bit of recurrent neural networks. Uh, the key advantage of uh, recur recurrent neural networks is that they can remember things as their outputs can be refed back to the model itself, to the network. This is important when you're dealing with, uh, for instance, natural language or anything that requires a sequence. Um, we can keep track of context of things. So a word can mean different things based on the previous sequence of words and even sometimes the next sequence of words. However, RNNs are very slow to train. Uh, you have uh, a lot of problem with long-term dependencies, long-term sequences due to what we call vanishing gradients. I'm not gonna bore you with the, the, the details of uh, the, the, the mathematical uh, problem, but at the end, for backpropagation, you need gradients, and your gradients need to be propagated back to the previous layers. And uh, the smaller these get, you know, they will be incremental, get slower, slower, and the gradients wouldn't be sufficient to train the, the, the layers uh, that are at the beginning. Uh, 
there you know there has been some improvements in that area we have had uh, uh, gradient highways with resnets we have had uh, lstms long short term memory units which were designed to address uh, this problem by having more or less what we call memory cells but they were still not sufficient and uh, um, they were also not very efficient because you still had to these uh, you had to train these models uh, uh, one word at a time now transformers transformers as you see them here, they consist of two parts, an encoder and a decoder architecture. And they have the concept of attention layers in there. It was first introduced in a paper uh, called Attention is All You Need back in 2017. So with standard RNNs and LSTMs, you typically enter your sequence one word at a time. So it's trained in a sequential fashion and has to remember these words one by one. That's pretty hard. Whereas, uh, um, with transformers, what you can do is you can enter sequences, the whole sentence as a whole, and there is a special layer that can uh, that can attribute positional information to each word in that sequence. This, first of all, uh, already helps us uh, uh, parallelize things, right? You, we have now we're not doing it word by one, but multiple words at the same time, making it possible to you know utilize this huge uh, um, matrix multiplication units in uh, the, the special hardware. Um, but also, we can now add uh, additional information uh, and attention for the relevance of each word within that sequence, which becomes the input for the following layers, which altogether becomes the encoder part. So then a similar architecture is done on the, the decoder part. By the way, not all models use encoders and decoders. There are models that are encoder only, such as BERT. And these are good at uh, classifications and sometimes uh, next word predictions, but not very good at generating moderate amounts of text. Decoder only networks, um, those can do that better and can be tuned with zero shot, few shot prompts. And this is also a very interesting area. Nowadays, that's getting a, a lot of lot of attention. So instead of training uh, uh, it for different purposes, what you can do is that you can give instructions to the model and then have it uh, complete things. And uh, Encoder plus decoder networks tend to be less fluent generators, but can be better at solving what we call understanding tasks. So you know, it can also keep track of uh, um, if you are explaining a game, for instance, the rules and apply those things when it's give, giving an answer. So this transformers approach has become the next best thing for natural language processing problems and has been used extensively in most of the large language models, uh, uh, ranging from BERT to Megatron Turing. So we've talked about the history of ai and some some of the breakthroughs um you know let's take a look at the, the the current state what we have and what we can expect i'm not gonna speculate on you know what's gonna happen in 50 years and you know, when we're gonna have um conscient uh, uh, self-conscient ai or other things but more like the the short-term achievements so I've already talked about this. Large language models, they have been in the rise recently. And their size have been increasing over the years. It looks like, uh, if you look at this, it's exponential. It's uh, following the, the Moore's law, looks like. Um, as you can imagine, the, the, the bigger your model, you can also capture more complexity with it. If you've ever heard of bias variance trade-off, that'll make sense to you. So um, the whole idea is that uh, if a model is too simple and has very few parameters, that will have high bias and low variance, meaning that it won't be able to, uh, you know, capture the 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 the, uh, the essence of the problem. On the other hand, if your model has a large number of parameters, then it's going to have high variance and low bias, meaning that it's going to overfit, right? So we need to find the right balance at the moment. Uh, that's quite difficult. Uh, we have now, if you look at this chart, uh, Lambda is, uh, when we talk about the number of parameters, uh, we're talking 140 billion, uh, uh, MUM is another one with 150 billion parameters. Um, these are Google specific. You might have heard of GPT-3. It has been uh, on the news for a very long time. Uh, I think it's been around for a few years already and it has 175 billion parameters. And these are not even the biggest models, right? Since then, there have been models with uh, 200 and 300 billion parameters. And recently, we had the Megatron Turing uh, NLG, which had 530 billion parameters. And we have at Google Palm, which is 540 billion parameters, half a trillion parameters. So that's a lot of you know, complexity. And it's not a fair comparison, but uh, um, you know, if you compare it to the human brain, you know, our, our uh, nerve 
nervous cells, the neurons are a bit more complicated than artificial neuron. Um, but if you want to compare it, we have uh, roughly around uh, 90 billion uh, neurons and 100 trillion synapses. The word is that GPT-4, the next version of GPT, is going to have 100 trillion parameters. So the question is, where is this going to end? And more importantly, do we need all this complexity? Uh, one of the founding fathers of John von Neumann. Um, so he uh, um, didn't like algorithms with many parameters. Um, there was a, a case where one of his peers actually won a prize with a uh, uh, an algorithm that used four parameters, and he wasn't impressed by that. He claimed that he could fit an elephant with only four parameters and make its trunk wiggle with the fifth one. Now, if you have any spare time, I uh, uh, you know challenge you to try this out. And with a hint, you can do this. Uh, you have to use complex parameters, but you can do that. But it already indicates that you know um, with more parameters, you can do more. Having more parameters. It's also very expensive. Uh, I have uh, uh, read somewhere that the, the Megatron Turing model with the half a trillion parameters, um, this was uh, trained by Microsoft uh, together with NVIDIA using multiple A100s. And the total cost of uh, the setup was around 100 million. That's a lot of money to train a model. I have read this week that uh, there were some improvements and uh, it was possible nowadays to train a model that's the size of the GPT-3 uh for less than a million but still that's a huge amount of money for training a model now there's been some interesting developments um this year uh, there was another network chinchilla and it only used 70 billion params and it did pretty well it has shown that we are actually more data bound than compute bound so maybe it doesn't make sense to increase the model size but maybe we should be increasing the data size you know train with more data Although there are some rumors that we might be running out of general domain data, so we have uh, to get data from other sources. Again, I am uh, thinking that uh, uh, organizations who have access to this amount of data are, uh, you know, um, the, the big uh, parties are gonna be using that data to, you know, improve uh, uh, the the, the uh, performance of these models. So. One of the uses of uh, large language models, well, these are interesting things, but how can you use them? Uh, we do have an example in Google Assistant. It's not even futuristic. This is a video, and I'm hoping that it's going to work and you're going to hear the audio. Um, and it's going to show you some of the, the capabilities. Let me try this. I hope you can hear it. Otherwise, Rens, let me know. Yes, I will. Um, no, we don't have sound. Otherwise, uh, what you can also do is, is share the link. It's of course nice to uh, to show it, but otherwise, worst case. Yeah, I'll I'll try it with the, the closed captions. No, it doesn't work. I hear, I hear something uh, now. Then we can put it louder. It's the. Uh, the zoom protection, I think, uh, on, on your laptop, right? That's <laughs> that's blocking most of the. Oh, uh, it's it could be. That's too bad. So <laughs> I'm. Uh, um, so this is okay. Um, so you can find this out. You, this is uh, uh, the Google Keynote from nineties. Uh, uh, um, so the, the whole idea is that, uh, you know, when the, the presenter uh, was actually talking about uh, uh, what she wants to achieve, so with her commands, there were lots of references to the, 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 their previous commands, like uh, show me the, 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 the weather and how it's going to be tomorrow, you know, making um, it possible to, to take the context into account, knowing, you know, what, uh, uh, what has been told already, having a longer kind of um, memory of things. And a li little bit of understanding as well, right? The, when uh, she mentioned, it's too bad that you can't see this, when she said, you know, uh, get me a lift to my hotel, knowing that, uh, you know, uh, what lift is, which application kind of is associated with it, and where your hotel is, where you're staying, that requires, you know, some knowledge to be able to do that. So you might already have this capability in your phones, although with the poor state of Android updates, in worst case, you'll have to wait uh, a couple of uh, more months, uh, you know. Okay, this is, uh, go to the next one. You're, you're so, not the first one who has video problems. I, mean, it's uh, I can imagine. I, I must admit that actually we, I, I'm not allowed to use, yeah. I'm sorry? 
Now, even if it does stream, it's typically pretty, uh, uh, you know, it, it gets a bit messy always with the video quality. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. I actually, uh, so Zoom is also not something that I use very often. It might also be on my side. Maybe there are things that uh, uh, I have to set properly. I have another video, but that has closed captions. So we are going to watch that without audio. So yeah. bear with me, please. Okay. So summarization. Um, so I've included this example because uh, the, the previous session, there were people in the, in the room who uh, had a business where it was important for them to, to get uh, um, the, the summary or the abstract uh, uh, of uh, uh, documents. And uh, we do have a model uh, at Google, which we built called Pegasus. And uh, it's basically what it does is abstractive text summarization. It uh, does it by masking some, some, some of the, the uh, content. It works pretty well. We haven't made the commercial, but you know the, the paper is available. I think we all even have uh, shared the, the checkpoints uh, of the model, so you can try it yourself. And this is not a trivial task, right? What you need, what you need to do is uh, basically uh, understanding of text to a certain extent. Uh, I know that there are classes where you're taught this now. We have models that can do it for you. Um, although not the most sexy feature, right? We've come a long way, you know, compared to the, the machine translation from the 70s. Uh, the, the flesh is rotten example from the past. Uh, the translation models today are more capable and can handle many different world languages. I'll admit that Google has uh, an advantage here as we are kind of um, available and present in many different markets. We do get to, uh, you know, or we have to actually invest in these models to make them work for them. Uh, nowadays, we use neural machine translation models. And these are trained by sentences and documents from the, the, the public that uh, public that uh, Waymo. Uh, one of the subsidiaries of Google is Waymo, um, and uh, um, they're working on autonomous uh, driving. So we have cars already driving around the US in a, a certain state uh, with no drivers. And if I'm totally honest, uh, I think it's going to take still five to 10 years, but uh, I do expect that autonomous driving is going to be one of those standard features that uh, you'll be getting like a, a radio when you, when, you have, when you buy your car. And I ho I'm hoping that you will have to pay then and not like, uh, you know, five years up front like Tesla is doing, wink, wink. <laughs> In uh, addition, uh, these data sets are also made available for others to use, you know, making it possible to, uh, you know, try out your own solutions, maybe do some crowdsourcing for that purpose. Um, yeah, AlphaGo. Uh, in March 2016, uh, AlphaGo defeated uh, the, the world champion 4 to 1. And it was trained on every recorded game of Go. Um, so it, the underlying algorithm is actually, and that this, this goes for other things that I've showed today as well, it's not a single network, right? It's, it's uh, an ensemble of different models you have with AlphaGo. If I'm not mistaken, uh, um, you have a coalitional neural network, a CNN, that kind of does the perception part. There is uh, some uh, Monte, Carlo, Monte Carlo tree search that uh, kind of comes up with the best uh, next uh, 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 moves. And you have some recommendation, uh, um, reinforcement learning, sorry, reinforcement learning that kind of correlates the, the, the moves to the, the end, end game. We've since then had alpha zero and uh, uh, this was trained differently. It was given the rules of chess, nothing more. And with only four hours of training, AlphaZero crushed the strongest trend, traditional uh, uh, chess computer five to nil. So, you know, just with only knowing about the rules. And since then we had AlphaStar and it was built to play the online strategy game StarCraft. And I'm not really familiar with this game myself, but I understand it's a complicated game uh, as you play with imperfect information, like uh, with Go and with chess, you can see the whole board, right? Uh, um, you know what, what your opponent is doing uh, directly. Um, but in StarCraft, you only see small areas around your own units. It's also played in real time, whereas, uh, you know, with the board games, you have turn by turn. Um, you get the time to, you know, come up with your next uh, move. Uh, but, you know, with these things, uh, you know, uh, a component can do many moves before you can have done your move. Uh, and uh, it's also played with uh, varying and dynamic forces. So you don't have uh, two bishops and eight pawns and all that stuff, uh, but you have to decide what to build and what to attack and all that stuff. And as you can imagine by now, it did beat the two of the, the top human players, 5-0 and 5-0. So. Now, AlphaCode is another encoder decoder large language model, but it has been specifically trained on software code. I've worked as a software engineer for almost 20 years, and I don't expect engineers to be replaced anytime soon. 
but I do expect them to get more assistance for, assistance for their job. Um, IDs have already improved a lot of things. If you want to do any refactoring today, it's just a, a click and then you just give the new name of the class and it's done for you automatically. But with projects like AlphaCode and, and GitHub Copilot, I'm expecting people to become more efficient and more importantly, write call with less errors. If you know these, these systems can uh, recognize the, the uh, situations where you're uh, prone to making mistakes, right? Uh, memory leaks, whatever, that will already be a huge gain for everybody. Now we go to the next uh, uh, video. And this one has a uh, closed caption, so I hope that's gonna... Maybe if you're, uh, can you increase the screen size some of it? Yeah. An alpha fault might need a little bit of explanation, right? It's like the relevance of uh, yes. protein structure prediction. Share the link, Murat, also with the audience. So it's because this is such a such a big yeah. moment. Uh, I, I think in biology I'll, that it's nice to. Uh, yes, nice to I'll, really... I'll, I'll uh, look it up. Uh... Uh, I've shared it already in the in, in the chat. Oh, you already did that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is actually a very nice animation and the, the whole intent of was to introduce the concept of protein folding problems. It's been around for a long time and, you know, uh, just to summarize what uh, has been explained in the video is that, you know, we know how proteins uh, uh, are formed, right? It's uh, based on a sequence of amino acids, uh, but they are 3D and it's very difficult to um, predict the uh, final 3D shape of these proteins based on the sequence that it generates them. And it's quite important to know that because sometimes we only know the 3D shape and we just want to know the, the you know what kind of sequence generates that. And this could be used for many different purposes. And evil at the end, to me, you know, one of these revolutionary things as well uh, uh, might help us understand uh, life even. When I was at the university, one of my uh, dreams was uh, to you know, um, to go into this area where uh, uh, you know I will be able to mimic a, a a living cell by making simulations of these things. And uh, um, back then, you know, one of the biggest problems was that we didn't even understand protein folding. So how will we even do that? So we have now made uh, huge improvements in this area. Um, actually, I read this week there was a uh, team um, that was able to do some sort of simulation based on the, 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 uh, the, uh, the molecular nature of life. So, you know, there, there's things being uh, done in this area that might change our life uh, uh, for good. And just to, to complete the alpha-fold thing, um, and this also goes for other things, by the way. Um, I know that Renz shared uh, the video, but DeepMind is one of the subsidiaries of, uh, of Google. And most of these things that I'm showing are research projects coming from them. So, you know, you can look those up and read about it. And AlphaFold itself, the very first version, it scored much better than competition. But the second version was leaves and bounds ahead of everyone else. Uh, um, just to give you an idea, a score of 90 or, or above is considered roughly equivalent to, to uh, experimentally determined structures, so the, the real structure, let's say. And AlphaFold 2 scored higher than 80 for many tasks. So we are not there yet, but we've made huge improvements. And I'm expecting a lot from this. Let me go to the next one. So we've now seen various examples of how AI models uh, are being used for practical purposes, right? 
Um, we can recognize things, we can understand language. Uh, there are even systems that can do uh, you know, speech synthesis and speech recognition. But what if we want to, to become more creative and uh, generate content, art? Although we've got different architecture for generating things. Um, we have had GANs in the past, and nowadays uh, the focus on diffusion models. Uh, to stay with today's main uh, kind of um, the popular kind of theme, you can also generate art with transformers. We have, for instance, DAL-E. It's an example of that. It can create art from a text description. It can even uh, combine concepts, right? Like uh, uh, um, you can uh, have attributes, so you can have styles. You wanna, you can say that I want the realistic, I want it to have cubistic, I wanna have abstract. Um, so it kind of has a uh, some sort of understanding of what you're trying to achieve. At its heart, it's an encoder decoder model. Roughly simplified, it has a text encoder, which uh, tries to understand what is being required from it. And then it has an image encoder, and at the end, an image decoder that basically yields this end result. At Google, we also have some of these, uh, uh, which we are not allowed to share outside of the organization. Imogen, while they are the most known ones, they are fun to play with. I know people who have spent hours generating interesting things, and I do see a lot of uh, um, investments in this area as well. I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, generating videos or uh, movies all together with, with this thing? There's even, you know, um, there was a, uh, I think, competition not so long ago where uh, a piece generated by AI won it. So, you know, uh, they, they, they are getting much better as we go along. So we can expect a lot from this area. And it's going to be my last slide. Um, so we talked about transformers. Um, we talked about large language models. Uh, but what is next then? Well. What, what I see happening is that, and I've already showed this in one of the previous slides, uh, um, there is now emphasis on multi-model, model with an A, uh, and multitask models. So MUM was originally designed to, to improve the Google search functionality. Uh, it's been trained on multi-language data, meaning that if you know we capture information, and this example is going to be about Mount Fuji, um, if the, the information about Japanese, we are capable of uh, transfer uh, transferring that information into uh, the English language. So it can answer questions even though the information, underlying information is in a different language. It also is intelligent enough to combine information. So whereas in the past you might have needed uh, multiple questions to uh, multiple searches to get uh, an answer to your question, like, uh, you know, um, what is needed to, to um, uh, you know, climb Mount Fuji, you know, it, it can know what Mount Fuji is, what you need when you do climbing. So there's a number of things it, it, it can do uh, under the hood. One other thing it can do is um, it can also handle image input. So not only text, but image. And we're also working on videos and audio. So if you look at this example, um, the, the, the question is, can I use these to hike Mount Fuji? So it has to understand, you know, what the, the attributes of this, uh, uh, product is, right? It has to understand that these are boots and what their attributes are, you know, but they're uh, good for hiking. And it has to understand what Mount Fuji is and what it's required to climb Mount Fuji. So bringing those two pieces of information to, um, you know, give you an answer. So I do expect a lot of um, kind of in developments in this area as well, where we kind of combine all these uh, different types of information to achieve different tasks. So. That's going to be probably the near future. Um, but we have, that's going to be in the near future, what we're going to see. So these were uh, the, the slides I had. Uh... Great, Amurad. And, and, and we have, um, uh, I think, 50 questions for you. <laughs> so let, let's see. <laughs> OK, I did expect a lot of questions, but 50 is a lot. Yeah, yes. there, there are many. But I'll, I'll try to um, uh, cluster them in, in, into the main groups and be respectful of your time. But. If there are more questions, sure. guys, then uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, first of all, my, my first question is, what, what, what was your personal reason for going into AI in that point of time, right? Because it, it was quite, yes. quite a while ago. Yes, I actually, if, no, the exact moment I decided it. So I uh, was at the university. So I wasn't at the university yet. I, uh, I was thinking about what uh, I was going to study because I, did, I had no idea. And um, one of my math teachers sent me to an AI day. And AI wasn't a new thing, uh, but it wasn't very popular either. So nobody knew about that. And um, I uh, went to my university where I studied AI, and there was uh, 
this video that they played. And uh, if you can look it up on YouTube, it's uh, by Carl Sims, Evolving Virtual Creatures. If you can look it up, do that. It's not going to look sexy. It's, you know, the, the, the graphics of uh, 1990s. But for that time, they were impressive. They were built with uh, SGI clusters, slicking graphics, uh, uh, you know, machines, huge thinking machines uh, were behind that. So what you could see there was, and this is a bit of a spoiler, um, you could see an evolution of uh, artificial creatures. And that made such an impact uh, okay. on me that I said, if this is already possible, I mean, we can get very far with this. So I, uh, you know, that video sold it to me. That was the reason I, I, I decided to, to uh, study AI. And at the same time, you know, the nice thing about AI is it's a very broad field. There are so many different things that you can do in that uh, field, right? There is a, you got, uh, I got robotics, you got cognitive psychology, you got biology, you got mathematics, if you like that. Um, you know, th there's a lot of things that you can do. You can, you know, if it's a field where you will never get bored. And it's now becoming quite important, even as part of our daily life. Clear. Yeah, I, I think obviously you went in at the right moment. I, I went in quite a bit too late, so I'm not trying to get. <laughs> it's, so the it's, age, it's, it's the age, Rens. You know, it's the age. No, the age. It's the problem. I, I went. I was in consulting for way too long. Anyway, there, there, are, there are two questions about, um, and, and and it's it's the part that you skipped over uh, quite. Uh, smartly in the beginning right so ai taking over the human race uh, should i be concerned uh, so should people be concerned um so you know the, 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 uh, i am not a philosopher right i uh, i know that there are some ethical things that we have to be uh, aware of and careful with um but i am quite positive positive in the sense that i think that we're going to make the, the right choices uh, when it comes to anything that's going to be uh, intelligent enough for us to you know, question ourselves. Um, you know, like with any technology, you can use it for good causes and bad causes. Even with a car, I could you know, create havoc, um, but I choose not to do that because I'm a good person. Um, so I'm also ex expecting that you know, most of the people to uh, you know, take that into consideration. And certainly within Google, there is a lot of um, you know, um, thinking is put behind that, right? So whenever we do anything, we try to be ethically correct in that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have an answer on that because I don't know, it's inevitable that we are going to do also things that are not going to be right, maybe, but as a, a human race, I think we are going to learn from it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's just part of our nature that uh, we will find a way to live together. Yeah. And it's fundamentally technology, right? So, so it, in the end, it, it, it comes down to human nature on how that will be used. But uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a question on the slides. Are, are the slides available? Or because I think you're using Google Slides, right? You... Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I can uh, I can share that. I will ask around. Um, I know that this uh, they have been subject to due diligence in the past, um, but I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Let, let me know. If, if they're available, yeah. I'll send them over. If not, then we have the recording. Um, are there any projects integrating quantum computing and AI? <laughs> My, I am not aware of that. Kind of That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think if I'm totally honest, uh, quantum computing is in, in its early days. Um, I don't see any advantage of using quantum computers at this stage, maybe in the future, right? But uh, today, no. I know, yeah, uh, yeah, that's the short answer. I, I don't see the added value of it at the moment. Okay, there, there's a question, and I, I think from a designer or maybe a design team, like, like, are there areas where you see design and AI intersecting? So is there an element of design? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, one of the things I, I just talked about, the whole being able to generate art, right, um, the, the, the GANs and the diffusion models and the transformers, I do think that it is going to help us. Uh, and with AI, the, I think the, the, the intention should be it's going to make our life better. Right, it's not going to replace things, but it's going to life our. Uh, it's going to augment what we can do today already, and even with the, the design, I do see. Uh, uh, I know a few companies already experimenting with that. So mm -hmm. some fashion brands are looking into using um, these generative uh, models to get new set of kind of um, fashion items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nice one. Um, here, here's another more philosophical one uh, for your Friday afternoon, right? So is, is it possible to teach machines ethical values? Ethical values. 
Okay, I need a bottle of beer, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I don't know, to be honest. I, I think, um, so th there's a couple of things that I, I believe in. And I think uh, when you look at intelligence, that's quite difficult to uh, define, right? And, uh, uh, you know, we have played with symbolic AI a long time. You've got now connectionism with the neural networks that kind of does emerging intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one day maybe, uh, but that's gonna take us decades. Um, so yeah, to show our answers, I believe that we can do that, but that will uh, require us to make a huge uh, development in um, you know, how far our networks are. They're at the moment very simplistic. Uh, they can do one thing very well, but we're already looking into this multimodal and multitask kind of networks. And if that becomes a bit more, um, complicated or not complicated, but more uh, evolved, then we might have these additional things that might uh, also emerge out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm, I'm not sure if that is completely comforting for the, for the person. <laughs> <laughs> but fair enough, I, I, th I think it's, 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 a, it's a fair answer. Yeah, I think, you know, some of these things are speculations at the end, right? I, I don't, I, it's very hard to predict uh, things and certainly if they're about the future that was said by someone. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a classic, right? Hey, yeah. GPT-4, you, you mentioned that I, I think yes. quite, a, quite a lot of people in the call will probably have seen or played around with GPT-3. Uh, and, yep. and when that came out, of course, it was a bit of a, of a shock, right? And and the GPT-4 is is 100 so in parameters, so it's technically brain-like in terms of... Uh, <laughs> right? it's It will have as many kind of parameters as we have synapses, but I also mentioned that our kind of neurons are much more complicated, right? You can't complain a single neuron with an artificial neuron because it, uh, I think it equates to four layer kind of a single one. Um, it's a numbers game, right? Uh, there will be one day a network that will have at least a compute capacity of a uh, uh, human brain. But I'm not sure about if, I'm not even know, I don't even know if they're gonna do with, uh, go ahead with the, the, the 100 trillion parameters because you also need a lot of data to train those things. And uh, the Chinchilla paper from earlier this year has already shown that it might not make so much sense to train larger models, but uh, we, we need more data to train even the ones that we have today. So um, yeah, I think we could get there, you know, again, the question is get there, what is there, right? What do we yeah. want to achieve at the end? Because these networks, even GPT-3 is pretty cool. And we have Palm and the, the, the Lambda that we have, uh, they are also pretty, uh, uh, good at the task that they are uh, basically working on. Mm -hmm. could, could you say more on the difference between the a neural, like a neuron in a neural network and a neuron in, in the brain? Because uh, of course, in a neural network, <laughs> you have multiple activation functions that so you can make it a bit more complex. But then yeah, the real, uh, real neuron is so more So this is again, based on a paper that I read many years ago. Uh, um, so I don't remember all the details, but they, there was this uh, um, a comparison with what you can do with a single neuron. Uh, with different synapses and uh, an artificial uh, kind of neuron that is connected in, in, a, in a network. And to be able to do the same thing, um, you will need to have much more complex in your artificial neural networks because the, the, the neurons were analog in a sense and they could do many things at the same time. Whereas uh, with the, the, the neurons, you know, there is, you have your input and then you have one output uh, that's going to the next layer. Um, whereas you could, you know, with, with the neurons do multiple things at the same time. So I'm trying to get to the, the details of that, but uh, my memory is uh, uh, not helping me at the moment. But it's a multifunctional structure versus a relative. It's a multifunctional thing, yes. It, it can yeah. do more at, at the same time, yeah. Let's do one more question for it. And I know sure. that because I'm, I'm working on my list of questions here, but on the other side, the list is growing. So it, it, it's, it's never <laughs> so sorry for everybody that doesn't get their, um, their answer that they're looking for right now. And I hope maybe in, in the future. Uh, you ended with the whole uh, vision of generative AI, right? And, and, and I, so my question is, what do you think is next there? You already mentioned video generation or, or other things. So mm -hmm. what do you think is coming in the next few years? Yeah, you know, um, so DALI is not even based on, on diffusion models, right? There's a lot of work going on in the diffusion model area. Um, and I think what I see is that uh, on art as we know it might be, uh, might, might change uh, because now we will have these uh, systems generating things that will be very difficult to, uh, you know, distinguish from what, what is created by an artist. And 
you know, that's part of entertainment and entertainment is a huge business. Um, so I do expect a lot of investments in that area to see what can be done. Maybe we will have, you know, songs being generated or uh, movies, the whole kind of movies, right? So I have seen Imogen generate uh, uh, video clips, very short clips. Um, so, you know, um, that's the beginning. So it's going to go much, much further than that. Can you imagine just saying that I want to have a Spider-Man movie in a... Uh, um, I don't know, photorealistic uh, style or a comic style, uh, having this story, this back uh, story, and then something is generated for you. That's incredible. If you have that to do it today, you'll have to invest bill not billions. Some, some movies, uh, they might cost uh, hundreds of millions, but still a lot of money. And uh, if you could do it just on your own computer, hey, that's going to change the face, right? We're going to get much more content uh, and maybe even better content. It could be that, uh, everybody gets their own uh, kind of preferences applied. So you, you, it's not like that. Uh, and this is again speculation, and I have no basis for this being true. <laughs> but uh, what if you could go to a a, a website and uh, you want to learn about a certain topic, and that you know that uh, applies to you, and the topic is presented in a way, in a video that is uh, fit to your to you your preferences. I mean, you, mm. you just, you're just asking a question, and then somebody explains it in a way that uh, you understand. I mean, it has you know, kind of many uh, areas where you can uh, apply it, not only entertainment, but also for education. Yeah, that's an area that uh, I would be very happy to dive into. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can imagine. The, the, the budget to train those kind of models at the moment. <laughs> that's <laughs> the hard part, right? Yeah. 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 Mula, th thanks so much. I think it was uh, amazing, and uh, and we took uh, so we took 15 minutes. I, I think we officially agreed on a, a bit less than that. So thanks for the time. Um, for everybody listening, um, I, I think we answered lots of questions, but not all. So, so sorry if your question is not answered. Uh, we'll share the recording tomorrow morning. Uh, slides, TBD. Um, and, and with that, have a good okay, weekend. Thanks. Move up. Thanks so much for, for joining. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.